God is not a bad investor. God has provision. He wants us to prosper. Why? Because we're supposed to provide for others. Why would he invest in someone who's going to keep all that blessing to themselves? When, when he could be investing in someone who's going to bless other people. Philippians chapter 2, we're finishing up a series. If you haven't been here, if you're visiting or first time in a while, I know summer is kind of a crazy month for traveling and stuff, but uh, I definitely, want, if you've missed any of these messages, I think they fit together pretty well. Uh, we've been talking about how to lead like Jesus, and we've been highlighting these four roles of Christian leadership uh, that, that the Bible kind of tells us that we're, we're supposed to be. You're supposed to be priests, prophets, protectors and providers. And uh, one of the biggest takeaways I think I've noticed from talking to, to some of y'all is that uh, a lot of you didn't even realize that you were a leader or that you were called to be a leader. Uh, one of the things we've been making sure you understand is, is don't, don't shut me out because you go, I, I'm not the president of anything. I'm not the head of anything. That actually every Christian is called in some way, shape or form to be a leader. It's, it's in that Genesis 1, kind of rule and reign over the earth thing that God gave to everyone who was made in his image. Are you made in his image? Yeah, so that's you. Um, and, and especially if you are a Christian, if you, if you call Jesus Lord, if you're, if, if you're called into his service, uh, which all believers are, uh, then, then we're also supposed to go and make disciples. And that is a leadership thing. In fact, the phrase, uh, back when I was younger and I didn't know what... It, disciple making was, all I heard was lead them to Jesus. You want to lead your friends. You want to lead people you go to school with. You want to lead, you want to lead them to Jesus. That is leadership. And we all should embrace these roles uh, and, and take it upon ourselves to be these things. And, and so we talked about a priest. There's no collar, no, no sacrificial blood on the altar anymore, thankfully. We, we just get to be the go-between, that a priest is a go-between that, that, that brings people far from God closer to the goodness of God, and we get to show them and intercede for them. And so we can, we can be a, a, a priest, and, and, and we should be prophets too. I know that, that prophets in the Old Testament did some crazy things. Guess what? God may call you to do some crazy things too, to express and, and speak and communicate his word. That's what a prophet did, is, is he spoke the words of God. We have the words of God. And you know, I was actually thinking about that this week, uh, because in those times, uh, a prophet had the word of God or the spirit of God on them in a way that nobody else did. You know, this was before this little event in the Bible called Pentecost and Acts, where the Holy Spirit came and, and began to, and, and so now when you believe in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Well, people of those times didn't have that Spirit of God on them in the same way. So a prophet was weird. A prophet was different. And, and, and it was, even though they may have followed God and believed God, there was a presence of God that was on prophets in a way that was noticeable. And now we, in, in a similar fashion, not the exact same thing as what the prophets did in the Old Testament, but you have that Spirit of God in you if you are a believer and you are supposed to speak forth His Word. But we're also supposed to be protectors. We talked about that last week, how, how we've got a, a pretty messed up world, and so the people that, uh, that, that need protecting, we're supposed to be the ones to step in to do that. Uh, that if you that if you see someone who is in need, if you see someone that's being oppressed, that we should be freeing the captives, we should be protecting the innocent. We well, that there are tons of different ways to do that, but we were called, and God equips us to protect people. Now, this was again, this was come out of this idea that dads, especially, because this was at first a Father's Day sermon that I decided, wait a minute, we all need to hear this, but but dads feel should feel that way about their their families and mother and parent, any parent really should feel that protective way about their kids. But we should also feel that protective way about the people that we love, the people that we, we care about. Um, but today I want to talk about being a provider. So we're going we're gonna to finish today talking about a provider. Now I know saying that word provider, you probably get a certain r r thought in your mind, making the bacon, right? A provider is someone who goes out and gets that bread and makes it happen for everybody. And we, we have that 
mentality from just the world around us and the culture that we live in, but it's actually a lot more than that. If, if I'm calling you, if Jesus is calling you to be a provider, it's more than about you need to be Big Daddy Warbucks and make it rain, right? Um, uh, hey, look, I'm all for Christians being rich, right? I, the, there's some people that say Christians shouldn't be rich. I think Christians should be rich, but they should share their riches, right? And so now this is not going to turn into, hey, you want to give me a thousand dollars and I'll make you rich type thing. But hey, God has provision. He wants us to prosper. Why? Because we're supposed to provide for others. Uh, I say this all the time. God is not a bad investor. Why would he invest in someone who's going to keep all that blessing to themselves when, when he could be investing in someone who's going to bless other people? And, and so he wants us to be that type of blessing and that type of, of provider. In fact, another word for it is I call it a gap filler. Right, it's coming along and finding the gaps that the this jacked up world that we talked about last week that that some people need protection from leaves behind gaps, leaves behind breaks in the bridge, potholes in the road, and and we are supposed to as Christians come in and fill those gaps. That we're supposed to go to these areas of lack and fill it with plenty, to be the ones that fill that gap. For every famine in Egypt. There is a Joseph that God wants to call to stock the storehouse. If you don't know about that story, go read Genesis, right? There was, a, there was an issue, there was a gap, and God called Joseph in this particular situation to be the provider in a, in a pretty supernatural way. And I think for every, we, while we might not take him up on that, while we might abdicate our roles and keep it to ourselves, I think there is a calling uh, for us to come into every one of those situations. That God is so good that for every time the world leaves a gap, he wants to bring a believer, one of his children, one of his people along the way to provide for that. Um, that I, I saw this or, and understood this in a kind of a, a powerful way years back that we had in, in Liberty, we had this lady come that was a representation for the uh, adoption, a Christian adoption agency. They came to talk about uh, that and how we could partner with them to, uh, to adopt. And they, were, they, they gave this stat that it filled me with some conflicting emotions. She said, I'll never forget it. She said, did you know that if Every church in America, for every church in America, if, if they would adopt one child, we would empty the foster care system. Like that. Overnight. I about fell out of my chair. I was like, wait. And at first I was excited. I was like, you mean it's possible? You mean that it's attainable? That, that the church could, could go? What a powerful testimony of God's provision for the church to just say, oh, you know that whole foster care system? We got that covered. I'm like, man, that's really cool. And I got excited, and then I got angry because I realized, well, why hadn't we done it yet? If, every, if, if all it takes is one person, one child to be adopted per church, and you're going, well, I know a church that's like four old ladies and they can't handle it. That's okay. Guess what? For every one of those churches, there's a mega church that can do much more than that, right? We're, we're getting lost on the point here, which is that we could do this if we would. And, and, and so I realize that, that we have fallen, even believers fall prey to this misconception that, that the world and, and our life exists to provide for us that we want to get what we can get out of the situation instead of taking it upon ourselves to be providers, to look for situations. We're all worried about the gaps in our life, and then, by the way, we end up complaining and doubting that God exists because there might be a gap in your life, when in reality, we should be looking to other people's lives and being who God uses to provide for them. That's the calling of every Christian and the truth is, Christians must stop waiting for others to do our jobs for us. You know, we were, I was just talking with somebody all this morning about the slow wheels of government and how you want to get anything done in the government, buddy, it takes forever, right? And, we, and I, I'm one of those, it's, it's, it's a preference way below my Christianity, but I'm a small government guy. I think we can handle it, leave us alone. Right, But it, it, in my experience with Love Chatham, I've become to understand and appreciate the fact that one of the main reasons why people rely so much on the government is because they can't rely on the church. 
That so many, so many church people love to complain about the government and how the church is not relevant anymore. And this, this generation doesn't need the church. Guess what? If we did our job as providers, the government wouldn't have any need to provide. That God never meant for an institution like the government to be the main providers for its people. He wanted the church to be. He wanted his people to be. And, and so we can't really complain until we start doing our jobs. In fact, all across history, we have seen those good, all the, so many of the hospitals, so many of the orphanages, orphanages so many of these schools that, that all around the world popped up and were such, made such a cultural impact. It was because a believer said, I'm not waiting for someone else to do my job. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to provide. I'm going to find that need, and I'm going to fill it. Right? There, there was, um, there's a particular verse I think should should be sort of the, the cattle prod, which is Hebrews 10, 14. Let us think of ways to stir up one another to acts of love and good works. It's like, come on, what are we going to do? Push each other to acts of good works. How can we stir each other up to go be the providers that God's called us to be? And so today what I want to do is I want to read from a couple verses that may not seem like they're talking about providers, but as I've sat in these verses over the years, I've realized that if we would take the Philippians 2 mentality about our, our lives and about how we handle people, that it will set us up to be the providers that God has called us to be. So let's look at Philippians 2. And I want to start just with verse 1. We're going to read through verse 4. But verse 1, Paul is, is writing to the church, uh, the Philippian church, and he's asking a couple uh, questions that he hopes he knows the answer to. Have you ever done that with kids or your class at school or somebody else that you're talking to where you ask questions knowing darn well what the answer is or what the answer ought to be, right? And this is kind of what Paul is doing. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? What do the Philippians go? Well, of course, Paul, of course there is. Well, is there any comfort from his love? Absolutely. Amen. Testify, right? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate, we all go, yeah. Nobody wants to admit that their hearts aren't tender or compassionate, right? Nobody's raising their hand going, not me. Maybe some of you, but that's, I'll deal with you later. But like, <laughs> these are rhetorical questions, right? Okay, so now that we have that established, now that we all agree that's us, is that you? I hope that's you, is what he's saying. And then he goes on to say this in verse 2. He says, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your interests, but take an interest in others too. Now, you, you may have heard those verses before. I think they're, they're really good memory verses that kind of get our butts in check every once in a while when we get selfish. But uh, he's giving us some commands here that I think will make us better providers. He's saying providers, first off, they work as a team. Providers work as a team. This is teamwork makes the dream work. Like, like I, I know when you hear the word pro provider, especially you dads, you're like, I'm a provider for my family. I'm going to go hunt and kill and, and gather, and, 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 and I'll provide for my family on my shoulders. And God's saying, no, we need to work as a team. That's why we're agreeing. That's why we're working together with one mind and purpose. That's, that's what he's saying is we got to do this thing together. There is a personal aspect to this, but we all have to work as a team. That's why God's um, his ideal situation for raising the next generation, what, is not a single parent. If you're a single parent, it's not ideal, is it? No, one, no one's arguing that, right? It, it, but God's ideal situation, even though he gives grace in those other situations sometimes, is for a mom and a dad to be the provider. A mom and it now, whether it might be two incomes, might be one. It might be mom provides something different, the dad provides something different. But the idea is teamwork. Let's work together to provide for this family. Your, your Christian life is the same way. I hope you have... A, that one friend that encourages you, that one friend, that, that, that mentor that, that brings you along. But we were never meant to be Lone Ranger Christians, that, that your spiritual needs will not be met without a team of, of church community uh, that, that, that rallies around and works together to make it work. Almost every calling that we get from God, almost every command that God asks of us is better done as a group. 
It's better done as a team. We read the Bible uh, with a very individual mindset. This is what God's saying to me. Really, the Bible is written to us because He loves it when we come together. He loves us, loves it when we're weak in this area, but then this area works together to, to make this happen, to overcome and compensate from your weaknesses. Go back to that example of, of the churches that could empty the foster care system, right? I, I can about guarantee you that in every church, I'm not asking for one family to shoulder the burden of adopting a child. That's very expensive. What I am doing is saying, well, if there's a family that has the energy, some of y'all like, I couldn't fathom bringing another youngin into my household. <laughs> you want me to die, pastor? Like, uh, I will explode. Okay, but guess what? You might have the finances to help somebody else do that. You might have the know-how. Some of y'all are like, I'm Danny Glover. I'm too old for this, and I need, I need to just give my advice, <laughs> right? And so maybe... Maybe one family is ready to raise them in their home and another family is ready to give them the financial resources that they need. Another family is ready to be the mentor. And there's another, and we all work together to accomplish this. This is, this is what God wants from us. And this is important for you to get because when you think of a, being a provider, the devil's going to lie to you and say it's all on your shoulders. It's not, right? We work together to, light, to lighten the burden of his commands. That's why Jesus says, the yoke I give you is easy and light, right? Because there's a bunch of y'all doing the same thing with one mind and one purpose. But here's the thing, in order to do that, providers also have to crucify their egos. You got to crucify, I, I know, you go, that's strong language. Yeah, kill it. Don't just put your ego to the side and say, we'll get back to you later. Kill that thing. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, is what he was saying. Because funny enough, I don't know if you notice this, but we are so good at being selfish. We are so good at sinning that we can take something as good as being a provider and make it a, a selfish endeavor, can make it about our ego, right? I, I call them uh, Instagram mission trips, right? There's a lot of these short-term mission trips that the, the, if we're honest with ourselves, we go over there so that we can take selfies with third world little kid and, and so that people will see how great we are. Oh, look at how spiritual they are. They're playing soccer, you know, with, with the little children. And it's like, all right, see y'all later. Back to, uh, and by the way, I've talked to long-term missions people. They hate short-term mission trips because it's a bigger pain in their butt to deal with these people that, that want to helicopter in and have the, have the mission trip experience and then bounce back to air conditioning when it gets too much. And they're like, you're really just making my job harder. But it's because of our egos, right? This is why some of y'all can't do a good turn without posting on social media about it. You got to let everybody know what you did for somebody else. By the way, Jesus has something to say about that. In Matthew 6, he says this. He says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth. They have received all the reward that they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. That's why I'll say sometimes, I'm not trying to steal your blessing. Or if you ever hear me say that, like, don't steal my blessing. Like, what is he talking about? I'm talking about Matthew 6. I'm talking about the more you do for other people so that other people will see you. I hope you enjoy that. I hope those likes were worth it. I hope all that, all that credibility and, and that was good for your ego because you've lost your heavenly reward for it. Right? I would rather get credit up there. I would rather get eternal blessings and eternal credit by not letting anybody know what we get up to. By, by, I would rather not broadcast the, the way that, we, that God calls me to provide for people because a Christ-like provider does it quietly. It does it whether they get credit for it or not. And God says, I'm not ignoring you. I'm, you're going to get credit for this in a way that, that we can't even fathom yet. And so we have to crucify our ego. It's easy to do that, though, if 
we as providers are focused on others, right? We have to focus on, you would think that would be, duh, providing for others means you focus on others. Again, not necessarily the case. A lot of times we provide for people for what it does for us. He says, take an interest in others too. I've counseled with, uh, with people before. Uh, there was one college student one time that was, was deal, battling depression and stuff like that and, and, and said, I think I just need to go do some good stuff. It'll make me feel better. And I was like, well, I agree with the sentiment of you, if you want to feel good, you got to do good. But also, you know, doing, serving other people, providing for other people is not self-help therapy. Right? We have to, because then you're focusing on, is this making me feel good yet? Is this making me feel, am I in a better mood? Do I feel better about myself? Do I think I'm less of a terrible person if I do these things for these other people? Then all you're thinking about is you. He's saying, no, focus on other people. And all of these things, by the way, are rooted in humility. So Paul just says, be humble. Be humble. Uh, And Again, humility, if you end up talking about how bad you are or even how great you are, that uh, either one of those things is not humble because you're focused on you. Uh, a phrase I use a lot that came from The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. You ain't got time to think about what an idiot you are or how great you are either way. If you're thinking of yourself less, if your mind and your prayers and your intentions are on others. So to be a successful provider, we have to get our mind on other people and out of our own thoughts, out of our own, is this, is this, what about me? What about, and stop worrying and worry about other people. So how do we do this? How do we provide specifically? Now I know you, some of you are going, I wish you'd been more specific. Look, I don't know your life. What I know some of your lives. I don't know all the details. I don't what what it may mean for one of you to provide, and and where God is calling one of you to provide may look totally different than the other. But there are some areas that that we can be specific about. Obviously, the first one is that we provide materially, right? Like, cough it up. Some of y'all love when I say it's not about money. You're like, good, so I can keep it. Not necessarily, right? That money and and finances was the context of. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 8, when Paul tells Timothy, those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, so if you're not going to provide, you have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. He's saying it's a big deal when you refuse to provide for people. And I love that it also gives us a hierarchy, right? Before you you know, lend Uncle Cletus another $100, make sure that your family that you're responsible for is taken care of, right? Because Jesus says, hey, where your money is, that's where your heart will be. Tell, tell, me, tell me you love me, and I'll show you your, where you're spending money on it, right? And, and so we're supposed to have a hierarchy here. And by the way, I love that, that also, because the world loves to, to take advantage of kind-hearted Christians who who don't use common sense when it comes to providing for people. There's a lot of people I know that said, I've tried to help, but it was a waste of money, and these people took advantage. And, and, and Paul says this to, to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, give according to what you have. I'm not putting a dollar sign on this, folks. I'm saying, he says, don't, don't give not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean that, giving, that your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourself. He's saying, use that God-given brain you've got, some discernment here, and figure out the best way to provide for others that isn't making it worse, that isn't enabling sin, that isn't making the problem worse than it was before. But we also, uh, by the way, that it's not just about that, though. Like, we don't stop at, I'm a provider, so I give money to these things. I think that, you ever heard a parent say, I just want a better life for my kids? You ever heard that? I really think it, it, that got popular after the Great Depression. You know, and, and certain generations, they just didn't have two pennies to rub together, and they wanted to do better for their kids. And when you dig down into that, what most people mean by that is, I want them to have more money and opportunities that come with money than I did. And it's a noble gesture, and it's a noble thought if it doesn't end there. 
If the, you're not just talking about money. Because you, life is more than just about the things that we have. And that's why we also need to provide relationally. Right? That, that when I say be a provider, I'm, I'm really talking about in the dynamics of friendships and family relationships. Right? There's, a, there's, only so, there's a certain amount of hours that you need to work to put food on the table, to take care of your bills. And then there's diminishing returns after that. Right? There's a lot of parents that have excused being absent from their kids' lives relationally because they can buy them stuff. And that's not what God intended either. Money and means, they're, they're hollow provisions when they're done without relationships, when that's all that there are. Right? Parents, again, this, you, you lead your kids. And so a lot of these examples are very parental here. Parents, your kids need your attention and your time more than you need to keep up with the Joneses. More than you need to give them everything that they say they want, every item on their Christmas list. They need you to be there. Your wife, your husband, your, your significant other, they, they need your time more than you need to go out and make more money so you can buy them a nicer car. They need to be p provided for relation. Ship wise Some of the best investments you're going to make are not money. They're of yourself. They're of your life, sharing life with them. But you also need to provide spiritually. Again, making disciples. Disciple, whether you've got kids that you're supposed to disciple, whether you've got friends you're trying to disciple or co-workers, God has called us to provide spiritually because Matthew 4.4 4 says, man does not live by bread alone but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. You want them to have life? You want them to be provided for? There is a spiritual component as well. Parents, you've got to be raising your kids up in the ways that they should go. I should not be the main source. Jenna, whatever, whoever teacher is over there, should not be the main source of spiritual provision in their life. It should be you. Spouses, y'all need to walk shoulder to shoulder pursuing Christ. Friends should be speaking the truth in love, adding that accountability and that encouragement. That's how you provide spiritually. I'm not saying you got to be like a, you know, the grand poobah, you know, sitting on a mountaintop going, come to me, my child, I'll provide for you spiritually. Don't give a word of wisdom and ring a gong or whatever. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing your priestly duty, doing your prophet duty, speaking the word of God and dragging them whether you have to drag them kicking and screaming if you need to to see god's goodness right now i know that this is a tall order i know i've given you a lot to 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 think about here this morning but the good saying we were talking about this earlier was you can't pour from an empty cup you can't provide if you have no provision yourself and so it is a tall order if you're working by yourself. But we fortunately have, have a God who is a provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. That's, one, that's an Old Testament name for the God who provides. That's why famously Psalm 23.1 says that the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. You may have heard the King James version, I, I shall not want which I used to get confused at. I'm like, you don't want the shepherd that... Give. There, that means there is no want, there is no lack, that you have everything that you need. Philippians 4.19 says it this way, the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. God has got more than enough provision for you to be able to provide for others. And so... We have to start there. God is the provider, and He provides things like faith. God provides us faith. You don't have to muster that up. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to qualify for it. God provides us with faith. Ephesians 2.8 says, It's by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. God also provides forgiveness. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with 
the riches of God's grace. What I love how that verse lays that out. God's got deep pockets when it comes to forgiveness, and he loves to lavish that on to those of us that would repent and believe. You're like, you don't know what I've done. Probably don't want to know. But God knows, and he can cover it. He's got enough forgiveness for that. And he also provides satisfaction. Some of you are more worried about not having the satisfaction. So many of the ills that we have to deal with in this world come from people with unsatisfied souls looking for it in the wrong places. That's why Psalm 107.9 tells us that God satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul He fills with good things. More than your job, more than your marriage, more than your kids, more than your hobby, more than your legacy, more than your filling in the blank. Those are all great things, but your satisfaction comes from God. And he's got more than enough of that. Because guess what? You'll be satisfied in your kids for a while until they grow up, until they hit, I don't know, two years old. Some of y'all made it all the way to teenage years, and then that satisfaction ran out quickly, didn't it? Not me, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Those things were never meant to... That marriage is great and all. You're so in love and you're chasing each other around the house. Uh, I, there's, there'll be a year. There'll be a year. It'll hit you. And all of a sudden, that's not going to satisfy your soul anymore. That job that's going so great with great coworkers and lo- that you're going to have some bad days. All the other things that you think, oh, if I, if I don't have, if I could just get this, I'll have satisfaction. You're going to hit that savings goal. You're going to get that car. You're going to get whatever it is you think you need, and then you're going to see that it really leaves you wanting. But if the Lord is your shepherd, then you shall not want. He also provides purpose. God provides each and every one of us with purpose. Ephesians 1, 11 puts it like this. Because we are unified in Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For He chose us in advance, and He makes everything work out according to His purpose. We have meaning. We have a higher calling. We have eternal purpose. And it's all from the provision of God. You don't have to wonder, why am I here? Why am I alive? What, do I, what am I going to do with my life? Why, why? God has given you purpose. He has given you meaning. He has given you, and even when all those other things run out, He won't. His provision won't. It's all summed up in Psalm 3410. That's a lot of scripture, but a lot of good stuff. Those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Sometimes I'm not sure we believe that. Sometimes I think that you're, if, if we do this crazy obeying God bit, that we're going to miss out on something. That if we turn loose of that relationship that we know God doesn't want us to be in, that we're going to lack. If we, if we stop pursuing these other things, that somehow we're going to miss the boat. And God says, you trust in me, you will lack nothing. Because God is the provider. So my question for you is, have you trusted God for your provision? Do you understand the provision that's available to you? Before you even think about providing for others, before you even think about doing for others, we have to have our cups filled with the provision of God. So would you do me a favor? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Because I want to make sure that you embrace the provision that's given to you. Let me just pray with you and and, and for you. Oh God, I thank you for your provision. And Lord, I thank you for not only the things that we can see, but the, the ways that you provide for us in ways that we'll never understand. But God, I'm I'm asking right now in this moment, I have I have just this feeling in my gut that not everyone believes this is true. That it sounds good on paper, but when the rubber meets the road and when we are faced with the reality, do we trust you for our provision that far too often we run right back into the hands of that sin, right back into the hands of that thing that we think we're getting our provision from, that we think is going to give us what we need. And while we see that it's 
Maybe not quite enough, it's better than nothing. And God, I just pray that you would give us the faith to believe you right now. That you would give us the the trust. That you would change our hearts, change our minds for anyone that doesn't quite get it yet. Lord, this is a supernatural thing and we're just asking you to change our hearts and change our minds right now. And for, for those of us that have experienced that, that provision, that, that faith that you've given us to salvation, God, I pray that you would remind us of all the ways that you've provided for us. It's so funny how quickly we lose our memory. How we, we find ourselves at the end of our rope on the ledge of that cliff and we, we have to take that step and we, we see you provided then. Why won't we trust you to provide for what's next? You've brought us this far. Why would you change now? God, reignite that that faith and that trust in your provision, Lord. Fill us with all that purpose and all of that satisfaction. Lord, give us that forgiveness that we need for doubting you for a second. And if there's anybody in here that doesn't know you, that needs to repent and believe, that needs to put their weight into your provision, God, I pray that you would do that in this moment, that they would cry out to you, that they would pray and they would ask for forgiveness. They would ask for new life. They would ask for a new purpose. And that, Lord, from your your riches, from your, your vast treasury, from your deep pockets, you would give that to us this morning. God, may your spirit continue to move. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.